Good morning, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Ryan, the pastor here at The Mission. Welcome to our online service. As we get started, I'm excited to announce that next week you don't have to watch us online. We will be providing a 30% capacity service in our building at 10 a.m. like we usually do. But with announcement, with an announcement like that, I will also need to highlight lots of other information so that we're all on the same page. I'm going to follow along in my notes, so please do bear with me. You will need to register for our Sunday morning in-building uh, service like we usually do before. You can call the office between Tuesday and Thursday, sorry, Tuesday and Friday. If you should get the answering machine because no one's in the office at that time, just leave your name, leave the number of people in your party, and if you think we don't have your phone number, leave your phone number as well, just in case we need to call you back for any concerns or anything you need to know. Do consider registering for two different lists that help us with a 30% capacity. One is the reoccurring list. The reoccurring list is for people who know they will be back Sunday to Sunday, but don't want to register each week. Just let us know if you want to go on that list. If you were on the reoccurring list before this last stay at home um, measure, you will still you will need to re-register. That list has been wiped clean and you'll need to let us know if you want to go back on that list. Another list that really helped us during the 30% capacity is the accommodation list. The accommodation list is a group is a list of people who if we reach 30% capacity are willing to stay at home and accommodate others and by giving up their seat. Thank you to everyone who registered for that list um, back in December. It really helped us as we saw a surge in demand for Sunday morning attendance. So do consider going on those two lists. That really does help us with this 30% capacity. It helps us to uh, keep weekly operations sort of normal, smooth, and running. The self-screening is going to be a little bit different. Screening is going to be a little bit different, I should say. We are going to provide a self-screening uh, test. We will post that on our website, and each Sunday, it will be sent out in our weekly email. You can take that test to uh, make sure that it's appropriate for you and your family to attend. Mission Kids will be operational. Aaron will uh, provide the correct amount of teachers and classes for kids who register. However, we will not be providing nursery at this time. Children can register from the kindergarten to grade 8 uh, age, ages, and Aaron will provide those classrooms. And if you're in grade 9 and want to join the older kids, uh, that's just fine. If there is a class that needs to be canceled or amended or something like that, he'll call all registered kids to let them know what will happen. When you and your family arrive to the building, kids can go directly to their classrooms and parents can go directly upstairs into the sanctuary. After the service is over, then you can go back and be reunited with your kids to then exit the building. The protocols for entering and exiting the building are the same as they were before the last stay-at-home order. An usher will be at the front door, and we're asking everyone to use the north side entrance. And we'll take your attendance. There will be a mask and hand sanitizer available if you want inside the door, and then an usher will uh, usher you into the sanctuary where you can find your seat. If you have questions about mask wearing and your specific situation, know that we are going to continue using the same Norfolk Haldeman Health Unit guidelines for mask wearing inside a public building as we did prior to this last stay-at-home order. But we understand that you might have a question about your unique situation and wearing a mask inside a public building. If you have that kind of a question, we will provide you with the phone number you need to call. You have to remember that we are not representatives of the Norfolk Haldeman Health Unit, and we need to let them answer uh, those questions. So we will provide a phone number for you to call. But we as a church congregation will adhere to all the guidelines that the Norfolk Haldeman Health Unit has set out for using a public building. 
And I think that's all of the announcements that I want to give. That's all the information I want to give. I just wanted to add uh, a couple of my own personal comments at the end of this. I am excited to see your faces back in the building and not be preaching uh, to this video camera in my living room. <laughs> uh, but I do just want to say, and it's an important reminder, that uh, I know that some of you will not be back uh, this coming Sunday using our building for, for possibly many reasons. One of them being possibly health concerns during this time of pandemic. But I also know that for many of you, a Sunday morning service that is amended by pandemic guidelines is more distracting than a blessing to your faith. And for that, maybe you'll choose to stay home. We just want you to know that if that's the case, no matter what uh, issue may keep you at home, you are still a part of our community. We still love you. We still keep you in our prayers and our thoughts. We still can take you into consideration in all the decisions that we make. And we really do look forward to the time when we can be back with no amendments or at least no pandemic amendments. We're so thankful that through these videos, we can all stay connected. And of course, we're um, we're joyed by the fact that uh, our Heavenly Father is bigger than four walls and uh, that He connects us and binds us as a community. To those of you, though, who want to use our building, to those of you who want to gather because gathering in our sanctuary is a blessing to your faith, to your mental health, to um, keeping you uh, on track and wanting to see each other, we just ask that when we use our building, let's use our building responsibly. Let's make sure that all the actions that we take inside our building are actions that keep the love of neighbor in mind as Jesus commands us to. But I do look forward to being back. I look forward to just that gathering again. Even at 30% capacity, I know that for many of us, it was a special time. We were so thankful prior to this last day at home that we were able to gather for almost five months when some congregations are still yet to gather and uh, we just need to be appreciative of that and appreciate that we can get back. Thank you to everyone who over the past uh, six, seven weeks, I guess, has taken the time to phone call and to um, make sure and check in with each other and find people who might be lonely, find people who need some care. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to do that. It is still needed and even post pandemic, let's not, let's uh, keep it going. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're just so thankful for the people who took the time to care. And, uh, you know, this Sunday is just a great time to celebrate being back. All right, as we get started, let's, uh, let's just start uh, by focusing on our faith. Uh, this service this morning, let's start by just opening up in a word of prayer. Father God, we again thank you for your provision of a building. Uh, we thank you that we have a place to gather. But Father, we do ask that you just guard our hearts um, against being careless. Help us to be responsible with ourselves during this time of pandemic. Help us to be um, thinking of our neighbors and what's best for them. Father, continue to build in us a heart of compassion for each other. Father, may we put down our TV remotes, may we put down uh, our social media, and may we uh, pick up a phone and dial a number uh, to see how others are doing, to see how we can give care, to see how we can reach out. Thank you, Father, for everything that you have given us. Thank you for your guidance and your continued guidance, the promise that you've made to always be with us and to never leave us or forsake us. Father, we just lift up our voices, uh, no matter where we're uh, taking this video in. We lift up our hearts to you and we open your hearts, we open our hearts up to your word and to what you have for us this morning. We give you more than a song, we give you our obedience. And Father, we're so sorry when we hold that obedience to ourselves. We thank you for your patience and your love, your mercy, and your spirit which empowers us uh, to overcome. Father, we just also uh, start to prepare our hearts for a time when we will remember the day of your crucifixion the day of your sacrifice, but also the day of your victory as we enter into a season of preparation for Easter. Father, may we again encounter your death and resurrection as a way to guide us into a deeper relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. having a happy new year um, and that you're doing well um, we wanted to play this song for you it's called in control and it's by Bethel I think no no it's by Hillsong um, one of the girls at our home group had um, brought it or shared it with us and we just think that it's super fitting for the time just to remember that God is in control of everything that we see of everything that we're experiencing in this crazy world and um, yeah we just hope that it's an encouragement to you today
Hello, Mission Church. It says in Philippians 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Let's do that today. Would you join me in prayer? God, you are an amazing God. Surely the depths of your goodness is beyond our ability to understand. Even in the midst of this pandemic, which has taken our loved ones and forced us to change the way we live our lives, we have so much to be thankful for. We're thankful because of who you are, what you've done, and what you continue to do. This week you've covered our land with snow, and that reminds us of the promise you made long ago, that though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Thank you for sending us your son to take away our sin so that we may be filled with your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can trust you to keep your promises. As we enter the season of Lent and prepare to celebrate your triumphal resurrection, 
We ask that you would prepare our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive your love. And may that love motivate us to love you and love others more. Lord, we think of those in our congregation who need you most at this time. We pray that they would experience your love, your grace, and your peace in tangible ways. Lord, we lift up Mary Williams' family. May you give them your peace that passes understanding and help them through this time of grieving. We also lift up Edna McCutcheon. May you give her strength and be her very present help. For all those who are lonely and those burdened by the restrictions related to this pandemic. Our seniors and our shut-ins, may you uplift their spirit and transform what our enemy wishes to use for evil. May you transform that into good. Lord, for any other requests that are, hearts, that are on our hearts that have not been spoken, may you hear our prayer. May you also use Pastor Ryan's message today to encourage and challenge us to be better disciples of your Son, our Lord Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. If you follow your Christian calendar closely, you'll know that this past week was the beginning of Lent. I am not an expert on Lent. It's much more intentionally observed in the Anglican, Catholic, and uh, Orthodox uh, Church congregations. But Lent is so powerful that it has permeated all denominations. You know, there might be different variations. Some years are more intentionally observed than others. But in many ways, it comes up in almost all denominations because it's a time of preparation for Easter. Easter is so powerful that we kind of want that time to prepare. It's different than Advent. Advent is a season of anticipation, whereas Lent is a season of preparation. We prepare ourselves to observe the solemn day of Christ's uh, crucifixion, but celebrate Christ's resurrection. It's a really a time of purification, I guess you could say. Um, there are many different practices and in, uh, ways to observe Lent. Many people will give something up, but many people will also try and take something on in the forms of spiritual disciplines. They might fast more uh, or read scripture more or be in prayer more as they prepare for the Easter weekend because we want that time of Easter, that time when we remember and celebrate to affect us deeply that we might become more like Christ. This morning we're going to look at the life of the prophet Elisha, but we're going to zoom in on one specific aspect of his life. We're going to zoom in on the part of his life when he is a disciple and disciple to Elijah. And you can bet I'm probably going to get uh, those two names uh, mixed up throughout this message. But that uh, scenario at that time of Elisha's life is very relevant to us. Discipleship or being a disciple is really the crux and the heart of the Christian journey. We are a disciple to Christ and we commit ourselves to him. Elisha does a great job of committing himself to his sort of earthly master, Elijah. And some of the actions that he takes can really help us understand what it means to devote ourselves to Christ in an everyday way. Like I said, Lent is, Lent is a way, uh, Lent is a time of giving up. You know, there are so many aspects of our lives, uh, so many titles that we carry. There are so many things discipling us that a message about being a disciple of Christ is really relevant. We need to make sure that of all the things that disciple us and teach us, Christ is the one who has our heart and disciples us in the, in the deepest places of who we are when it comes to truth and right and wrong and God. You know, we want to let him uh, mold and shape that deepest part of us. Elisha does a great job of allowing his earthly uh, master, uh, Elijah, to shape and mold that. This morning, I just pray that it would or this message would challenge us in our commitment to our master, who is Jesus Christ, as we look at Elisha, who commits himself to his master, Elijah. I'll be reading this morning from 2 Kings chapter 2, and we're walking through verses 1 to 14. 
When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah and said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha said, so be quiet. Then Elisha said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stood at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be, give, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. So let's not forget about the sort of historical backdrop to Elijah and Elisha's ministry. Both men face a very daunting task. This is, spiritually speaking, one of the worst times for God's people. God's people were very wayward in their relationship with God. They broke the covenant very casually and they allowed idolatry to uh, pervade throughout the culture. We also read at the end of 2 Kings about the Babylonian army coming in, the temple being destroyed, and the people going off into exile. So this is not a good time. Elijah and Elisha face a very difficult task in bringing God's word and trying to steer them back. And it highlights the importance of discipleship because you and I we face difficult tasks in life. We face a difficult task now during this pandemic. And so we want to be good disciples so that we can learn everything we can from our master so that we can be prepared and equipped. Elisha's uh, journey starts back in um, 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 19. And those uh, f- the few verses following that, you can read about the calling of Elisha. And here uh, we see that Elisha goes through a time of testing. There are five tests and uh, they come in a very odd sequence, but because it's because he's being tested as they journey. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But he faced these five different tests. Three of them come from Elijah himself. He invites Elisha to stay where they're at. 
as they travel. He invites them to just stay at Gilgal, Bethel, and uh, Jericho as they travel. And each time he's invited to stay there so that Elijah can carry on by himself, Elisha makes a commitment. And he says that no matter where Elijah goes, he will follow him to the end. Elisha really demonstrates the quality of loyalty. He's very loyal to his master. And that's an important lesson for us. What I think is going on here, I think that Elijah is traveling to a couple different prophetic schools where you can learn and study the word of God and learn in the tradition of becoming a prophet. And maybe for Elisha, this was an opportunity to stay where he maybe had some friends stay where there probably was an easier stay because you might have had a place to live and food to eat. Whereas traveling with Elijah would have meant, you know, being on the road and living off charity. And it wasn't a very glamorous life. As we know, the God's people spiritually were very wayward. But yet Elijah really demonstrates loyalty. He does a great job of saying that no, he will stick with him no matter what. And in between these visits, there's this really interesting test where the, those who are at the prophetic school come out to Elisha and they said, do you know that your master is going to be taken up to heaven? And Elisha says, yes, I know. And then he asks them to be quiet. And I'm sure there is some really deep and profound reason why he says that. But it's as if he is saying that, yes, even though my master is heading towards his final hours and final time here on earth. I will still stick with him. I'll still stay beside him right to the end. And you know what? There's a really interesting parallel between this commitment to Elijah and Jesus' disciples uh, to Jesus during his time of crucifixion. And it's one of the reasons why I brought this verse up because there's this tremendous parallel. Elisha does a great job of being loyal right to the end. But yet that's not what we see from Jesus' disciples during the Passion Week and certainly during his, the day of his crucifixion. We see that they scatter. We see that they're not loyal to the end. And these two scenarios really need to be in our heart as we examine this text. You know, what kind of disciples are we? Are we the dis- disciples that will stick with Christ or right to the end, our master? Will we stay with our master right till the end? Or will we desert him when times are tough, when we don't understand what's going on? You know, Elisha tells them to be quiet. I don't know if there's something more going on there that's, you know, symbolic and profound. But he is at the very least being loyal. And he's saying he's going to be with his master until the very end. And he does a great job of just being that great, loyal disciple, committed to his master and following him. I think that Elijah is traveling to these schools to let them know what's happening, to say goodbye, to let them know that God's word is going to carry on in Elisha and to just, you know, be in prayerful um, and be in prayer and to say goodbye and to say thanks and to wish them all, but also let them know, you know, to be hopeful and to think towards the future. Elisha has just passed the loyalty test with flying colors and has challenged us to think about our loyalty to our master as well. But now he's about to face another test. He and Elijah travel until they get to the Jordan River. Elijah takes off his cloak, strikes the water, and a miracle happens. The Jordan separates and dry ground is set before them for them to cross over. Will the demonstration of this power by God sink into Elisha's heart as he faces now a character character test? Elijah gives him this test in the form of a question. Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Now, you might think this is a gift, but the way I read it and the way a lot of other commentators who want to scratch the surface on this also read it, say this is a test because the question is an open-ended question. Elisha could say anything. And let's not forget the context. Elijah is about to experience his final few moments here on earth. And God's future ministry on Elisha is at stake. This is a question for Elisha about what do you think will prepare you for the ministry you are about to take on? Let's not forget that Elisha is passionate 
about his master's mission. And so too, we are also passionate about the ministry of Christ. And what do we think will equip us for the future? Are we going to need lots of experience and knowledge? Are we going to need lots of degrees? Are we going to need lots of help? Do we need political power? Do we need financial wealth in order to accomplish God's you know, ministry? Does that what we need to equip us for the future ahead of us? Elijah answers and what he says reminds us of something very important about what equips us for the future. Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, as I try to un- understand what he meant by a double portion, he doesn't mean, can I become twice as holy as you? He doesn't mean, can I become twice as important or twice as powerful as you? Rather, he's saying, the spirit that is within you, may it also be within me. And that's what I need to equip me for the future that is still ahead of me. And that is such an important aspect to our discipleship. We have to remember that it is God's spirit within us that equips us for our future and nothing else. For Elisha, knowing that Elijah was going, knowing the task that was ahead of him, especially in a time when God's people were so wayward, He knows that the only thing that's really going to shape him and mold him and truly equip him for the future ahead is God's spirit. You know, so too right now we face a pandemic and uncertain times and even beyond uh, the material needs we have, what is going to prepare us for the ministry that we have ahead of us as we minister to our friends and our family, as we minister to our neighbors and co-workers in this context here and now and into the future? It is through God's spirit and it's by God that we are going to be equipped. It's an important lesson for all of us as we think of uncertain futures. What is going to equip us? What do we need to take on the future that's ahead of us? Again, Elisha just proves how important, you know, taking in everything from our master is. Elisha is clearly reflecting on the miracle he just witnessed. He saw God provide a way through the Jordan River. You know, the Jordan River was often seen as a symbolic, um, it was symbolic of the hurdles that we all face to God's plan for us. And when the water separates and he crosses on dry ground, he remembers, oh yes, it is God who provides. It is he who provides and is he who I want in my heart to guide me into the future. And it is for us how what we want and what we need to desire in our hearts to prepare us for the future God has for us as well. Elisha is loyal, he is equipped, and now he is ready to move forward, but not without first saying goodbye. The two men continue conversing. When a chariot of fire comes down from heaven, the two are separated and Elijah is taken away in a whirlwind. And of course, this grieves Elisha. The text says that he cried out to God. He mourns and laments. He has, he appreciated every moment he got with his master. It's a good lesson for us to stick with our master right unto the very end. But now it is time for him to move forward. The disciple must carry forward the mission of the master. Verse 13 Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back to went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. So this is clearly um, a sign that God's power is with Elisha. God is blessing him and getting and carrying him forward into the mission and the purpose that he has for him. This is a great opportunity to talk about these unique, these names that these two men have that are so close, Elijah and Elisha. That is very intentional. It's not just a coincidence. Elijah, translated loosely, means God is Jehovah. 
meaning Jehovah is the God amongst all gods. He is the God that is greater than Baal and all the idols that were in the Israelite temple at that time. He is the one true supreme living God. That is a truth that the people needed to learn and know. Elisha, translated loosely, is God is salvation, which means that Elijah was establishing one truth and Elisha is establishing another truth. God is salvation. He desires or God desires all to turn to him, turn away from their sin. God provides salvation, transformation, redemption from these sinful habits and he offers that to all. And so both these men have their mission, they have their purposes, and they are to carry them forward. I see so many parallels in between these two men and what's happening between Jesus and the disciples. There's so much lament and grief over their departure, so much lament and grief over Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. His disciples, Mary, uh, those who stayed at the foot of the cross, lamenting over his torture, his humiliation, his death. Elisha grieving over the loss of his mentor. But then I'm moving forward. Elisha moving forward into his purposes to try and do his best with the people of Israel. And the disciples then moving forward to fulfill the Great Commission, to establish the church, to proclaim Jesus, to set captives free, to fulfill their mission in uh, building the kingdom of God. And it is a great reminder and challenge for us as well. Are we engaged in kingdom building? Do we know our kingdom calling? Can you name your kingdom calling right now? Do you know where you are serving and intentionally building it? If you don't, this is a great time to be in prayer and to engage yourself in a deeper way. You know, Lent is a time of preparation and there is no greater um, journey and there's no greater thing that uh, a disciple does than being prepared for what's about to come. And may we see this time as a way of continuing our discipleship to do what our master, Jesus Christ, is calling us to do. You know, we give ourselves many titles. We call ourselves many things. But may we first remember that we are disciples. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we are so thankful that you are the one who leads us. You are the one who teaches us. You are the one who equips us. Father, may, we, may you find us loyal. May you find us desiring your mission. And Father, may we carry your mission forward. Father, we thank you so much for the great examples in Scripture that you've given us. People that we can look up to and people that we can learn from. We thank you for the preservation of your, your Scriptures. We can, uh, we can apply them to our lives. We thank you for Elisha. We thank you that he was a good disciple, that he was teachable, that he was passionate and he was loyal. Father, may those characteristics be found in us. May this time of Lent be a time where we are transformed more into the likeness of your son. May we be more and more prepared for our calling, the calling you lay on our lives to contribute to building the kingdom. May your kingdom be built through our efforts and Father, whatever is built in our lifetime, we acknowledge that it is yours, it is for your glory, and it is only because of your spirit that lives within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus.
the joy He bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We'll sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and